Welcome back to the 2022 Cancer Research Institute Virtual Immunotherapy Patient Summit. During this next session, we are going to learn about the latest advances in using immunotherapy to treat pancreatic cancer, one of the hardest to treat cancers out there. We're excited to be joined by Dr. Robert Vonderheide, who is an attending physician in the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, director of the Abramson Cancer Center and Abramson Family Cancer Research Institute, vice dean and vice president, cancer programs at the University of Pennsylvania Health System in Philadelphia. Be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box throughout the discussion. Brian Brewer from the Cancer Research Institute will pass those along. Dr. Vonderheide, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Tamarin, and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining, and thanks to the CRI for this opportunity to uh, discuss immunotherapeutic strategies for patients with pancreatic cancer. As you have been learning from some of the other sessions in this summit um, uh, about some of the basics, new immunotherapy um, approaches, I'm going to show and talk about how these are relevant to patients with pancreatic cancer. And there are three main types shown in this Venn diagram. There are checkpoint antibodies of a variety of, um, of formulations. There are CAR T cells, and there are vaccines and agonists designed to stimulate an immune system. In pancreatic cancer, as indicated in the slide, there's only PD-1 antibodies currently approved for use for a certain small subset of patients with pancreatic cancer, those with microsatellite high instability. Um, and, um, and what we're learning is um, opportunities to extend this reach. Um, part of that will be to uh, deploy those approaches with standard of care approaches, such as chemotherapy or PARP inhibitors, which I'll talk about today. I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about treatment of patients with advanced disease, but a, a real accelerating aspect here is bringing these combinations forward to patients who have localized disease or locally advanced disease and, and giving immunotherapy sometimes before surgery, sometimes immediately after surgery. And, and that's a, a, a lot of enthusiasm and excitement for those approaches as well. So let's begin, checkpoint antibodies. Um, these are the off-the-shelf antibodies. You see them on TV. They reverse the breaks of the immune system by binding to specific immune breaks. Um, in pancreatic cancer that has low mutational uh, burden, it has fewer T cells than most cancers and lower PDL1 expression, there was not much expectation that these drugs would work by themselves. And they really haven't outside of MSI high tumors. Um, it, whether alone or in combination, results have not been what we wanted. So that has led people to think about combining checkpoint antibodies with other approaches, in particular chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors. And why do that? That's because over the last 10 years or so, the major advance for patients with advanced pancreatic cancer has been the use of combination chemotherapy to, at least for the moment, uh, halt the tumor from growing and to get the patient stabilized and allow uh, the immune system to recover and to go after, go after the, the cancer. So the first idea was to combine checkpoint antibodies with chemotherapy, and there are mixed results of doing simply that. Um, a Canadian study that was published earlier this summer did not show benefit by adding checkpoint antibodies to standard chemotherapy such as gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel. Also published this summer, however, was another study that showed if you combine PD-1 antibodies with gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel, there is a survival benefit in the same patient population. Although drilling into those results, you can see that the patient, not all patients did well, but only a subset of patients did. Very interestingly, uh, the data is that perhaps one can identify these patients ahead of time by measuring parameters in the peripheral circulating immune system. Uh, and so that's very exciting and prospective studies are, are, are planned. Uh, the CRI has been very instrumental in advancing that concept in these clinical trials. Another uh, exciting approach has been the use of PARP inhibitors uh, for patients who have germline mutations in things like BRCA1 and BRCA2. And here, instead of adding them to chemotherapy, they're used in sequence, chemotherapy first, followed by PARP inhibitors. The chemotherapy, of course, has side effects, so we're very anxious to discontinue chemotherapy, and, and also it's toxic, ultimately, to the immune system. So building on this notion of sequential therapy and using PARP inhibitors in the so-called maintenance setting, um, a recent study um, uh, 
uh, treated patients who have had a good response to platinum chemotherapy, stopping the platinum chemotherapy, and then adding PARP inhibitors, this time with checkpoint antibodies. And the one that showed great and a little bit of surprising result was CTLA-4. So this is not FDA approved, but this is showing the possibility of using chemotherapy up front, stopping it, and then coming in with PARP inhibition and checkpoint blockade as a way of um, treating patients with advanced disease. So more to come on that as clinical trials, uh, additional clinical trials are being designed. What about CAR T cells? These are the customized genetically engineered uh, T cells made in the laboratory and then given as an infusion or an injection back to patients following a schema as shown in the upper right there. Uh, why do this? Uh, this is using CAR T cells synthetically made to be potent, um, like a living drug, instead of relying on the patient to make high potency T cells in the body, which has been very difficult for patients with pancreatic cancer. The downside is that, as all of us know, pancreas cancer is surrounded by this dense connective tissue, the stroma, that um, is very hard to penetrate. And there's other barriers that are toxic to T cells. So, so the T cells need all the advantages uh, that they can have. And using these engineering approaches might be one way of doing it. So there have been a number of clinical uh, trials. Um, results are being published. Um, um, and uh, overall, there has not been uh, a strategy so effective as to warrant FDA approval. In fact, we've realized that there are issues if the target is not specific to pancreas cancer, and also the T cells becoming um, uh, very tired, exhausted, and not being able to get the, the, get the job done. So there's, uh, based on these insights, there's now redesigned next generation CAR T cell approaches, which are now back in clinical trials for patients with pancreatic cancer using as a base um, second generation and next generation CAR T cell approaches. So still great promise there. Related to that, is an adaptation of this cellular engineering approach to target T cells specifically against mutant KRAS. So why do that? Mutant KRAS is the oncogene that drives more than 90% of all tumors for patients who have pancreatic cancer. And there's been great excitement because although once thought to be undruggable, KRAS is now clearly druggable with inhibitors, really shining a light. What more can we do? And immunologists have now realized, building on work, really going back decades, that the immune system can recognize mutant KRAS, not as a full-length protein like antibodies recognize, but rather as fragments that are expressed and shown to the immune system on particular molecules in a very complex arrangement illustrated in the upper right. Um, this can actually work. And what's been exciting over the last year or so have been anecdotal case study reports showing that patient T cells engineered to be reactive against mutant KRAS peptides can actually regress tumors and do so safely. Very early days, there's nowhere near FDA approvals, but more and more work being done, more and more clinical trials. One of the downsides, however, is that this approach depends on the patient's precise mutation. So first of all, you have to know it. And secondly, it's restricted to just that mutation. And it's also related to the patient's HLA type, which is like the white blood cell type, sort of like the red blood cell type, but these are for white cells. And not every patient has the right combination. So not every approach is going to be applicable to a wide number of patients. But there is the hypothesis that a medicine cabinet of sorts, these all types of varieties of KRAS T cells can be generated so that the next patient uh, will have a very high chance of uh, having at least one of those therapies be, be relevant. Also, I want to talk about vaccines and agonists. So here, there are multiple formulations in many clinical trials, and, and how this is accomplished is wide-ranging. Uh, peptides, proteins, cell and gene therapy, including now mRNA vaccines, um, for patients with pancreatic cancer have, have entered clinical trials, the very technology uh, that we used against um, COVID. Um, related to that are agonists, these immune stimulating uh, agents, not checkpoints, sort of the opposite side of the coin of checkpoint, checkpoint antibodies, but here actually flipping the switch and turning on the immune system 
Uh, these have also entered clinical trials. And an example that we've worked on uh, quite in detail is using CD40 uh, to activate the immune system. Why do this? As I mentioned before, um, the natural immune response, the, the, the natural T cell response to pancreatic cancer is often very disappointing in, in patients. And it's hard to simply cut the brakes on those T cells and expect much to happen. Instead, you really need to activate uh, T cells in the first place. And that's where vaccines and agonists come in. So as I mentioned, there's many clinical trials of these vaccines. And, and time and time again, we're able to see um, the ability to generate new immune responses specific for the tumor. Gener we're able to activate the immune system and do so safely. And as work is progressing, there is, is as yet no FDA approvals in this, but many, many clinical trials. One recently published clinical trial combined CD40 agonists with chemotherapy. And again, similar to as we talked about before, it, it wasn't universally effective, but among the patients treated in this way were a subset of patients who did very well. And we can identify, we think, who those patients are, again, by a peripheral blood test measuring the so-called immune health of a patient as they um, start the clinical trial. Um, so more work on that forthcoming. Finally, um, I spent um, the last few minutes talking about treatments for patients with advanced disease. Um, what, what about another idea where we actually use the immune system to prevent or intercept cancer at very early stages? You may have seen this fall the NFL is advertising a campaign called Intercept Cancer. And the notion is that can you use um, approaches, in, including vaccines and immunotherapy approaches, um, for healthy individuals who don't have cancer um, but are at high risk for cancer um, in some way or the other, either family history or um, lifestyle or uh, genetic, uh, genetic inherited genes. And why could this be effective in pancreas cancer? Pancreas cancer actually grows slowly. Um, and it's, it goes from a stepwide fashion to these very early lesions to finally cancer that shows up on a CAT scan or a chest X-ray. The notion here is, can you use the immune system to identify these very early lesions before their cancer, intercept them, and prevent them from becoming full-blown cancer? So in fact, although it sounds like Star Wars, there are now several clinical trials um, for interception vaccines underway. Again, very early days. And some examples include, again, using vaccines against mutant KRAS, because KRAS is working at those very early lesions, even before the cancer is a full-blown cancer. Another approach is to target um, a molecule like telomerase, also called TERT, and to do so in individuals who are at high risk for cancer, such as individuals who carry mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, which beyond breast, ovarian, prostate cancer also imposes an increased lifetime chance of pancreatic cancer as well. Uh, so more to come there. As you can see in just this quick introduction, there is a great deal of effort across the board to use our new knowledge in immunology and our new knowledge of cancer biology and genetics to craft new and better therapies that are safe for patients with pancreatic cancer. I want to emphasize that there is hope for all stages, for all patients, and that ongoing research and work like that supported by the CRI is crucial for the success of these efforts. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Von der Hyde, for that wonderful presentation on pancreatic cancer immunotherapy. It sounds like we have a long way to go yet to get to cures from immunotherapy, but it also sounds like there's a lot of very exciting research happening, a lot of opportunities for clinical trials. So any patients out there who are interested in enrolling in one of these trials, I encourage you to come to cancerresearch.org or email us at patients at cancerresearch.org to make an appointment with the clinical trial navigator. It's free and confidential. So with that, uh, those of you watching, if you have a question for Dr. Bonderhyde, please type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. We will try to get to as many of these questions as possible. Some of you submitted questions at the time of registration, so we'll start with those. Uh, Dr. Vonderheide, uh, people say that pancreatic cancer is especially hard to treat, and you talked about some of these uh, some of that in your, in your presentation. Can you just say a little bit more about why for immunotherapy, and especially 
is pancreatic, uh, very difficult to treat. Right, and it and it is um, the the um, one of the problems is that um, and and this distinguishes pancreas cancer from so many other types of cancer is this shroud that it grows within, which really hides, makes it hide from the immune system, and uh, we're worried that the immune system just doesn't know it's it's growing there. And there's when there is um, uh, in, um, some immune cells that that get interested, the ones that might kill the tumor cells they are suppressed by any number of um, mechanisms. And part of the research over the last few years has been to identify all these various molecular mechanisms that are suppressing the immune system and making the pancreatic cancer able to hide. And slowly but surely, trying to find ways to address each, each one of those. Um, there, are, um, um, there are tractable ways for each of those. And as you said, it's going to take a clinical trial research to understand the best way. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, we have a question coming in. My grandfather had pancreatic cancer. You mentioned something about inherited risk. Uh, am I at risk? And is there a test I should get? So we're understanding more and more uh, genetic risk to pancreatic cancer. And there's a wide variety of inherited genes um, that would make you at risk. And they are passed down from families. Uh, typically, families uh, who have this type of syndrome, the pancreas cancer is detected earlier in life. Um, depends on how old your grandfather was. But e e even in the absence, uh, we are encouraging more and more uh, patients to understand their, uh, their inherited uh, um, uh, mutations. These are widely measurable by, uh, by um, um, commercial tests. And, um, and it's part of, uh, in most centers, standard of care to understand if, if these, um, even in the absence of a family history, if these types of inherited genes are part of your pancreas cancer and why? Because, as I mentioned, many of them change how you would treat the cancer um, uh, um, very dramatically. So it's important to know. Uh, one of the one of the things you talked on was uh, combinations, and even that, uh, given where we are with immunotherapy right now, uh, often it is given in combination with standard therapy. But there is there are some questions coming in about this as well. So let's touch back on it again. Um, I'm curious about immunotherapy as an option for me, but worry about stopping my current treatment. Can I get both? And are there trials that will allow me to keep getting standard treatment? Yeah, this is a, um, a major conversation in the field right now. Um, and there's a, there's a dilemma. Um, on, on one hand, it, it is in fact, for patients with advanced disease, it is these new combination chemotherapies that are the best chance to stop the tumor from growing and uh, help the patient feel better right away. Um, We've tried many times to add, add immunotherapy on top of, at the same time. Uh, and there's some hints of success in certain patients, as I talked about. Um, we're finding perhaps a better opportunity is to start with chemotherapy and give immunotherapy afterwards uh, and sequence instead of everything all at once. Um, and, and that way it allows the, the, the patient to feel better and the immune system to be healthier and respond. Can you do it the other way around? Can you start with immune therapy followed by chemotherapy? Not so sure about that. We don't as yet have, for most patients, an immunotherapy where um, it would replace chemotherapy, uh, unfortunately, um, in the advanced setting. A, a very provocative notion is to perhaps give the immunotherapy for patients who are going to have surgery, to give that vaccine or something like that before surgery and then go to surgery or to have surgery, give some chemotherapy, stop it and give immunotherapy. We, there's, so there's many sequences, many combinations um, and, um, and, and to explore all of them is going to take time and clinical trials. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of where things stand right now. Thank you. This is an interesting question. <clears throat> Uh, my aunt has diabetes and was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Is she eligible for immunotherapy? Is there a link between diabetes and pancreatic cancer? There is. Uh, so there's many types of diabetes, some of which are related to uh, autoimmune dysfunction. 
in pancreas cancer, it's the other type of diabetes that's related, uh, the, the non-immune related. In fact, it is estimated that um, um, up to 2% of all individuals who are newly diagnosed with type 2 uh, diabetes, uh, that they are harboring pancreatic cancer. Um, and, uh, and of course, something like 30% of patients with pancreatic cancer have type 2 diabetes. So there's a very tight link. Um, it, I don't think it's necessarily an immune link, um, but it is certainly an epidemiological link that is giving us traction on early detection and screening. Uh, large national studies underway on this very, very important topic. It's a great question. So if someone has type 2 diabetes, should they talk about this with their doctor? Absolutely. Particularly, the, the, the data is at new diagnosis of diabetes. If you've had diabetes for 10 years, that's a different story. Um, but it, in the setting of being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes for the first time, this should be a conversation to have with your physician. It's incredible. Um, I mean, uh, just as a side note, I, I, you mentioned that this is uh, perhaps advancing uh, our ability to, to er, detect pancreatic cancer early. Maybe there are some signals there that uh, that might we might be able to test for in the future uh, with those blood tests that you were talking about too. So that's I'm just very curious. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No. We're, so so we're going to make the biggest. Um, improvements for patients with this disease by uh, early um, detection, um, uh, finding patients when the pancreas cancer is the lowest possible stage, uh, even intercepting cancer, as I, as I talked about. We need to know who those patients are. It's very, it's very hard to, we don't have a mammogram. You know, we, we don't have the blood test that in some other types. So we need other ways and using these clues of epidemiology to find out who are the patients we're meeting who are at the highest risk for pancreatic cancer and screen them for the disease or intercept against the disease. Um, ultimately, I think that'll make the biggest headway for patients here. That's wonderful. Uh, here's a question. I've heard that um, I've heard a lot about side effects of cancer treatment, especially chemo, and that they can be bad. Is it the same with immunotherapy for pancreatic cancer, and how do you handle that? Do you see um, side effects in patients being treated with uh, immunotherapy? We do. Um, it's um, they're the same types of side effects that we see with these immunotherapies used in other um, in other types of patients. Um, most of them have to do with the fact that um, the immune system is activated and can. Um, begin to react against normal normal uh, parts of the body, uh, the liver, the thyroid, the pituitary gland. Um, but by now, since these antibodies, these checkpoint antibodies have been available for, you know, a decade, um, there are very, very good algorithms to keep patients safe and um, to mitigate these side effects. The important thing about immune-related side effects is that um, you have to pay attention to them. They can be very, very serious. They are completely different than the side effects we see from chemotherapy. It's just a different, different spectrum altogether. Um, and so um, we have had as a clinical, clinical care community over the last 10 years needed to learn new approaches for these side effects, which, which has happened. Um, um, just like we needed to learn how to handle uh, combination side effects from combination chemotherapy. Um, there is um, um, a great deal of effort, as I talked about, to perhaps use chemotherapy up front with a certain type of side effect and then stop and allow patients to recover from those side effects to get their you know, energy back and everything else, and then come in with immune therapy, which won't cause the same side effects, it has a different side effect profile. So that, that sequencing should and is making a lot of sense for patients. That's excellent. Uh, a question that we have here is, I'm interested in enrolling in a clinical trial. Uh, I'll do anything to beat this, but I'm just curious, how long can I expect to receive immunotherapy? Well, um, a couple points there. Um, Outside of the few examples I, I mentioned, um, access to 
immunotherapy approaches for patients with pancreatic cancer are by way of clinical trials. So that's definitely, um, every clinical trial is a little bit different. And one of the things the, the questioner is, is raising very good is, um, uh, how long do, do we have to give immune therapy? And it's really an open uh, question in the field. Um, it's, it, for chemotherapy, we, we keep giving it until a patient can't take it anymore or the tumor starts to regrow. Um, but when you think about um, immune therapy, in the ideal world, you give it once. CAR T cells for treatment of lymphoma, we give them once. And then they, the immune system then lives and, and, and does its job um, you know, long-term without repeated doses. So w- for any given formulation of immune therapy, we're still a little uncertain as do you give it for a month? Do you give it for six months? Do you give it for a year? Do you give it every week? Do you get every month? Do you give it every six months? Many, many. And the key is unlike um, some other types of therapies we use and our mindset that we have developed over 50 years of developing oncology for the immune therapy, more is probably not necessarily, more is not necessarily better. More is not better for biological processes. Uh, you need a Goldilocks. You have to find like, just the right amount of immune activation so that it kills the cancer but doesn't cause side effects. So that's that's a very, very important and active uh, question in the field right now. Does it vary from uh, patient to patient or um, what the status of the patient's health quality is at the time? It, it does, of, of course. Um, you know, you have to tailor all these things to the, to the patient's uh, performance status and how they're, how they're feeling, if they're having side effects. You know, are they having a side effect from the immunotherapy? Um, you, you may have to stop right away or you may have to delay. Um, it's really a, an art form. Um, um, and, um, but as we develop, as newer and different types of immunotherapy come on board, they have different guidelines on sequencing and toxicity management. And, um, and many of them are, that's part of what we're learning on clinical trials. See, uh, you, uh, this is a question coming in, uh, one, one, one of our attendees is very curious about the BRCA gene that you mentioned, um, saying, uh, I know BRCA is strongly associated with breast cancer, and you mentioned that it's also associated with pancreatic cancer. Why is it? Uh, why is that? It's a good question. Maybe, what is so, BRCA? Maybe you can yeah, say take a, a step back. So um, BRCA1, BRCA2 are genes. We all have them. And they, and they work. It's not the presence that's the problem. It's when they're broken. And, and um, unfortunately, in many families, you, you inherit a broken copy so that the other copy can break in the setting of a cancer often. And, and, um, and you're one step closer to cancer formation. Um, it was first appreciated in breast cancer. That's why it's BRCA. But these tumors can also develop, uh, these, this, this syndrome can also lead to ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, pancreas cancer. You can inherit the mutation from your mom or your dad. So it, it, this is how prostate cancer, you know, this, it's relevant to men. And, and, and so um, what is not known in the field is why it's just primarily those four tumors and not some other types of cancer that uh, mutations in BRCA lead to. Um, in, in, um, but the important thing about BRCA one and two is we can measure it so precisely and we can understand a patient's risk so precisely that we can say, um, you're, you're feeling healthy. You're normal. You have this mutation and you're at this definable risk of these other cancers. Let's intercept, let's prevent, let's intensify um, the, the search and the treatment of these early lesions now before they cause trouble. And if we can do that, then we can extrapolate to other patient populations who are at, at high risk as well. Of course, everyone, uh, no matter what type of cancer, is going to ask this question, which we often get. 
um, aside from the broken genes you mentioned and uh, the risk that diabetes might be associated with pancreatic cancer, what else do we know about the causes of pancreatic cancer? Is there anything that uh, individuals can do to help minimize that risk? You know, population studies uh, point to smoking, um, aging, and obesity as contributors to the risk of uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, the, um, uh, and, and that explains a, a, a lot of patients who go on and, and develop pancreatic cancer. But I would say there is an enormous mountain more of information that research will reveal as to who is at risk for high risk for pancreas cancer and who is not. And that's, that's where we are right now. So we're, we're, we're out of time. Any last uh, thoughts you'd like to share with those of us watching for patients and caregivers who are experiencing pan pancreatic cancer right now? There is an enormous um, community behind you, supporting you, uh, looking for new and better ways to treat pancreatic cancer. Um, find a partner, find your alliances. Um, let's let's uh, work together um, to beat this cancer uh, and, and, um, and look for every possible way to, to treat it. There are more and more and increasingly number of great ideas to think about. That's wonderful to hear. Thanks so much for that message. I know it me it's meaningful to so many people hearing that come from you uh, as, as a world leading doctor in this field. Uh, I hope that gives people hope. So thank you again, Dr. Vonderheide for joining us today for our, our immunotherapy patient summit. And thanks all of you who've watched today. Please stick around and see our prostate cancer session coming up next. Thank you.